Hey everybody, welcome to this workshop. This is How to Unlock Your Film's Market Potential. I'm Ben Palman. I'm one of the co-directors of the Liftoff Global Network. And um, I'm going to go into what we're going to be covering in detail in a second. But um, I just wanted to say that this video is for um, filmmakers out there in amongst the network who are beginning to create content for the marketplace and how to begin to think about that. I'm going to be introducing, at the end of this video, I'm going to be introducing Liftoff's Market Representation Initiative. Now, this is an, an, an initiative, that's a hard word to say, isn't it? It's an initiative for uh, professional members. So you will need to be a professional member to join, and there is a fee involved in that. So I just wanted to start by saying that, you know, at the end of this video, um, I'll show you how you can join and how you can get involved with it, if that's something that you're working on, if you are at that stage. But I just wanted to start by saying that, uh, you don't need to, um, you know, you don't need to join and you don't need to uh, be even working to what, you know, you don't even need to be working on market ready content right yet um, to get value from this video. It's my aim that by the end of this video, you've learned something about how to unlock your film's market potential. So, um, you know, whilst this video is really for professional members and people who are beginning to kind of begin the stages of of liftoff market representation. Um, we're gonna make it widely available for everybody just so that, um, you know, if, if you are beginning to create content, develop content for the marketplace, and you would like to partner with us with liftoff market representation, and I'll go into all the details in a minute, um, then, uh, you know, you can get on board and then we'll be really happy to work with you. But if even if you decide not to, that's absolutely fine. And it's my aim that you're gonna learn something through this workshop anyway, regardless. So with that said, um, let me go through what we're gonna be covering today. So we're gonna start off with some problems and solutions. So what are the problems and, you know, let's look at some solutions to the problems that people generally face at this stage in their career. So at this, at a certain point in creatives, um, you know, out, a creative output when people start making films, like um, usually it's short films. So if you make one, two, three short films. At a certain point, people start to question, how do you then begin to move up in the industry? How do you begin to create content that's ready for the marketplace? How do you find industry partnerships? How do you begin to think about distribution? How do you, um, you know, begin the raising finance? So that's, this is thinking... Ooh, this is thinking on a larger scale and beginning to work in a professional capacity within the wider industry. The industry is huge, right? You can you can see the amount of content that's being produced each year. Um, so what are common problems? We've been doing this uh, market representation initiative um, for many for a couple of years now, a good handful of years. And we've seen uh, we've, we've got we've had some great examples of success, but we've also seen, you know, what people struggle with. Um, so I just wanted to go through some problems and then some solutions for that. I'm going to be heavily focusing on, um, you know, value. What makes a valuable product? Why does what makes a uh, what makes the industry find a product valuable? And and how can you, um, you know, how can you fit your product, your project into into that kind of um, thinking. Um, and we're going to be going through some examples. I think there's six examples here. Yeah, so there's six, going to be going through six examples. These are examples that come through the Liftoff Network, um, through market representation, and have found success in various different ways. And I'm going to look at them because they provide some insight into, you know, what you can do, what can you learn, and um, and how can you apply that to your own your own projects. So let me just take a look at my notes, make sure that I've covered everything in this little preamble and we'll get straight into it. Um, this pro workshop is probably going to be, you know, 45 minutes or so. And then um, at the end, you know, you can ask me any questions and um, you can, uh, we'll post this in the hub as well. You can ask any questions in the, um, you know, in the chat below. So let's have a look. Yeah, so my, you know, my promise to you is that by the end of this video, you will learn, have learned something about how to unlock your film's market potential. So stick around to the end. Um, and if you haven't learned anything about that, then let me know and I will try and explain it in a, in a better way, you know. 
And uh, if you have, and you do have a project, or you're beginning to think about a project that you might that might be suitable for this, then you know I hope that you uh, you know at least consider joining the professional membership. Perhaps you already are a professional member, and um, in any of these cases, I, I you know I hope you learn a lot today. So let's start with some problems. Now the first problem is kind of. At this stage of the of people's career, um, people often find themselves kind of looking at the marketplace and in the industry in general and just saying and then finding it pretty opaque. You know, doors are closed. It's hard to understand um, who does what, uh, what's the difference between a sales agent and a distributor, who, you know, the rights deals. Um, these are things that are, you know, not generally taught in film school and uh so and it, and and it's often about who you know right so if you um if you have connections then doors can be open for you and if you don't then it's it's really hard to to open those doors so what do you do about that and the lack of knowledge so it's it's really hard to find a partnership and as i said before film schools don't really you know, teach you the nuts and the bolts of the industry of distribution deals and raising finance and and how the market works. Um, so how can you, you know, uh, how can you combat your lack of knowledge? There's obviously a ton of competition. There is an incredible amount of product that's fighting for attention from audiences and from industry. And uh, there's a load of noise in the industry as well. There's uh, many different layers to, uh, you know, streaming, to development, to uh, to, there's different territories around the world um, and there's creative pain involved in this as well. I'm going to be assuming that most people watching this are, you know, you guys are the, 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 the directors, the writers, the producers, the, uh, the one man bands, the two man bands, um, two people bands. And you, you guys are, you, you know, you're the create, you're the creators of your product and your project. So, if you come into it and then you get rejected, it can be quite, you know, personally um, painful. And, and I, you know, we, we, we understand that. So what are some solutions to these problems? So an opaque industry, one way to get around it is obviously to educate yourself and to know exactly who the players are in the industry. What do they do? We'll get, I'll be getting into that in a second. That's my, that's my next point. But the most important thing is a high value product. I'm going to get into exactly what value means in a second. So, because um, that's kind of, this is kind of mo the most important thing. And it's not what you think, um, or, you know, perhaps it is what you think, but there's, there's some, so some nuance and some extra layers to it. So the aim of the game is the highest value product possible. And imagine the extreme. If you had the best, um, whatever that means, best film, uh, in your area, in your genre, and you market it correctly and you, you connect it with the right people, the doors will be open to you without, without a doubt. So the, whilst the industry is opaque, uh, the most important, the way to combat that is through quality, through your quality of your production and your quality of your output. Um, and as I said, we're going to go into exactly what that means in a second. Um, lack of knowledge. So you must educate yourself on how the market works, the nuts and the bolts of who the different players are and you know what, what potential deals might look like. And um, to help you with this, I'm gonna be uh, giving some free production accelerator modules. Um, I'll link them in this, this video somewhere. These are two, two, work, two workshops, two videos, two modules that go through in much more detail, like the nuts and the bolts of um, of everything I've just been talking about, really, like uh, sales agents, distributors, um, rights, deals, territories, uh, uh, the changing landscape of all of these things, agents, and and um, uh, I, you know, I, the, the production accelerator is a is a paid workshop that professional membership um, professional members have in the professional membership um, area of the of the network hub. I'm giving we're going to give these modules to you for free to so to help you to you know um to educate you and then if you are a professional member and you haven't gone through you know particularly the last section uh which is where we begin of the production accelerator where which is where we begin to focus on the industry specific stuff i highly recommend you go through that 
Um, and then uh, also, you know, read books. A really great book is the film in this. I've got it here, actually. What's it called? The International Film Business by Angus Finney. It's a couple of years old now. Things are dynamic and changing all the time in this industry, right? But uh, um, it's a really good kind of overview of all the nuts and the bolts of everything and, and uh, specifically how that applies to the indie filmmaker. Because obviously, if you work within the studio system, everything is, is different. And um, if you work inside a, a, a massive company, then everything is kind of um, totally different. So that I highly recommend that book. And let's get on to value, shall we? So, um, oh, no, 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 track core metric. I don't want to skip over this one. So creative, I wanted to put this in to talk about creative pain. So as the creator of your particular project and um, you have a goal that you're working towards, let's just say that your goal is to like find a, is to find a distri distributor, right? Now, if you have that goal and you then you approach, what do you do? So you approach a distributor and you, um, you know, you find yourself trying to find a distributor. Then, so the question is, who, who do you approach? And you start reaching out to, you know, distributors. Then you get the no kind of, um, or you don't get any response. Then the creative pain comes from the, the, the feeling that somehow you failed as an artist. They don't like your work and... Uh, that's painful, right? But a way to re you, a way to reframe it is to track one core metric that's going to move you to closer to your goal. And in this case, if you were trying to find, you know, a distributor, then uh, one core metric that you should be tracking is how many people have you spoken to, how many emails have you sent, how many meetings have you had, how many conversations have you had, and if you're not having any kind of face to face or you know, through Zoom conversations, then you're doing something wrong. So it, focusing, reframing it in that way, hope I'm making myself clear here, uh, reframing, it in, reframing it in that way makes it less about you and your, you know, they don't like your work and more about you just need to find, you know, have enough conversations until you find the right partner because uh, you know that there's somebody out there that is going to be... Um, th th your product is valuable. We'll get onto that in a minute. You know that. And you know that there is uh, somebody out there who is, has, is, has worked in your particular genre or you, and your story before. And you know that your product is going to be valuable to them and a partnership is going to be fruitful for both of you. So f looking at it that way removes, your, removes yourself from, you know, thinking about kind of uh, your, you know, potential failure as, a, as an artist and more towards um, what's the one thing that you need to do in order to move you towards your goal. And that should be in this example, this simple example, that should be how many conversations have you had? How many meetings have you had? And uh, what has been, you know, you're going to learn a lot by talking to like 10, 15, 20 people, having meetings like this, presenting your project, and then um, getting a sense of, of, of how it connects. You're going to learn a lot more than that. Because what most people do is send a couple of emails, don't hear back, or maybe have one meeting and it goes bad and then they don't, um, you know, they don't push through. So don't be that person. Um, I, you know, track the core metric. Now let's go on to value, shall we? So what makes a project value? What is um, value in the marketplace? Let me just check my notes here, make sure I'm covering everything that I need to. Um, you know, value, different people have different senses of what makes a project worth their, um, you know, time. What, like a, a distributor, a sales agent, a, a financier, they're all going to have a different kind of set of criteria. They all deal in different types of product. It's important that you identify specific people who work in your genre and work in your particular you know, thing that you're making, the industry is massive. It's not just kind of film. It's lots of subsections, as you know. Um, but value isn't this first point beyond good film. Value is not it just being a good project, whatever that means, you know. It's being a good project is a minimum requirement and you, you need to find out beyond 
my my story is like groundbreaking my the acting is amazing the cinematography is like exceptional all of those things are, are a given you need to find out what the value is to other people that's beyond those things what will other people what will interest them about your project what is going to make them go this is a project that we really like because we you know we work with this kind of stuff um perhaps they're a uh you know a, 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 a horror sales agent for example then you're gonna if if you're making a horror if you're making a horror feature film you're you're probably going to want to partner with people who work in the horror genre that's a really kind of simple example um and so this is moving into the next point really like what is it to have a valuable product um actually let me take a step back for a se for a second sometimes it's really good to kind of abstract yourself from the film world and think about things from a different industry and see how the two things compare so i like to give this example of like a, of, a, of a watch manufacturer imagine that you're manufacturing a watch you're a you're big you're you're big let's just say like a sports a sports watch you're um can you it's a bit blurry there. There you go. A sports watch. You're beginning. You're a first time. You know. You're a. You're a new company. You've got some investment. You're developing a sports watch, and you want to find. You know. You want to 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 explore that industry. So, um, how is that? Oh, sorry. How is that going to be similar to to film? So you want to make the best product possible. You want to know who the. You know what what areas of the industry. What, what areas of the marketplace you're. You're not you're not making a um uh you're not making like a, a high end Rolex you're making a sports watch so that immediately you know who your target market is, and you want to know um you you know how much it's going to cost you you want to know how much it's going to sell for and you want to know who are the partners in the industry the distributors or the you know the 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 route the pipelines to different stores you you're going to need to know all of that and looking at different industries. And then thinking about how the film industry works um, can be helpful, right? So when you're making a product, uh, and we're talking about film now, you need to know what it is. So what is your, your what is your product? Your your product is it a feature film? You know, is it uh, what genre is it? What's the synopsis? What's the what's the what's the main hook? What is the uh, compelling logline? So. If you were to think about your last project right now, are you able to say very quickly what it is? And I just want you to think about, I'm going to pause, and I just want you to think about, are you able to give us the genre and give us the, the log line? If you struggled with that, that means that you're not entirely sure what your project is. The most important thing for you to know is to be able to say, it's a, a a horror comedy and it's about da 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 for example that's because that's what it is that's where it sits in the industry um this next point cost you need to know how much if this is in the case of if you're um you know if you're if you're in development or if you're in if, if you're in production you need to know what it's gonna if you're raising especially if you're raising finance you need to know what it's gonna cost and that isn't some guesswork or some kind of like we're going to spend 10 grand on this 10 grand on this 10 grand on this it's a breakdown from the scripts like a line by line budget breakdown of like all the below the line costs and below the line costs means um without stars and without um the above the line costs so you can look that up but it's like stars it's producer fees director's fees like all of those kind of things like the actual um uh the cost it's gonna the 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 sunk cost, the price that it's gonna that it's gonna take, the money that it's gonna take, trying <laughs> struggling to uh, struggling to think here. Um, the the money that it's going to take to uh, manufacture your product. So line by line, like in the script, and it comes from the script. Like where, what are the locations? How many times do you need to move the the crew and the and, and the set? What's the 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 props? The budget for special effects everything and there is there's really good um product there's really good software out there that will help you do this um you should you could partner with an ex really experienced line producer that maybe is, that's maybe worked in in you know higher level stuff to help you break down you can pay them to break down your script give you a budget um unless you can 
if you're raising finance, unless you can go to somebody and say, this is what it's going to cost and this is what it's going to make. This is the next point, the revenue point. Unless you can do that, then you don't know what you have. Right. So what most people do, again, in this day, at this stage of things is say, um, I've written a feature film. I'm raising money for it. It's going to cost 300,000 and they maybe go as far as to kind of break down rough sections without ever getting to, um, you know, a final draft or as close to final as possible. You can always, you know, you can always make it, uh, changes until the, until the, until principal photography. But um, what's my point? My point is that, that uh, with the final, with a, with a very near, near final draft, you should then start to like do a budget breakdown, a schedule breakdown, so that if you were given money tomorrow, you were, a, you were able to start. You know, you're able to press play. You've got all the pieces in place. You know, you know your locations, you know the cost, you know um, transport, you know who you're gonna, gonna use. And budgets change, of course, but unless you do it in a professional way, you're not gonna be taken seriously as a professional because what most people do is say, I've got a really good idea. It's great that, you know, it's gonna be a good film. It has to be beyond a good film. And, um, and I just, I need to raise some, we need to raise some cash. So if you've already got a completed feature, then obviously the cost is kind of, is, is less relevant. Um, but, uh, when you're talking to people, I always try, I always say, you know, don't be so upfront with how much it costs. If, if you are, if you are producing a feature film, uh, it, it in the three hundred thousand dollar pound range, just say it's like a, it's below below a million dollars or around a million dollars. Because if you go and approach some um, industry professionals and you say I've got a really super low budget film, that might put them off. They might be like, "We're not interested in super low budget. We want like, you know, exceptional quality. We don't deal with anything that's below like." you know, whatever it is. You don't want to um, disqualify yourself right from the beginning. Anyway, next point, revenue. You need to know realistic projections of what your product is going. Remember, we're thinking about now what makes a valuable product. And uh, we're abstracting it slightly, thinking about potentially, you know, a, a, a watch or something. But it applies to film as well because it helps us to kind of think about things. So, you as as well as knowing what it is and how much it's going to cost a manufacturer you need to know the potential revenue and in the film world this needs to be realistic you cannot on your proposals you cannot put revenue um you know outliers you can't put um, paranormal activity made this much and this film made this much and this film made this much because anybody who is in the industry or knows anything about anything knows that that film is one in a, in a thousand so it's very unlikely that your film is going to do the same. So you can't make, um, you can't draw that comparison. You can use success, you can use successful um, comparisons, but it has to be, it has to be comparable. So you can't use examples of, of say you're making a thriller, you can't use um, examples of thrillers that have got stars in it unless you are going to have an equivalent kind of star that carries the same amount of weight. Um, and you need to know your target audience. Let me just check my notes here. Was there anything else I had to say about that one? Um, realistic. Yeah, not, not paranormal activity. So, yeah, okay. So, target audience. Now, the, the target audience means who is going to buy it? Who, who is at the end of the whole, like, uh, tree of script? Imagine the tree of production, right? From the very initial idea of conception to script to the production to um, post-production to everything, right at the end of this like tree is the audience. Who is the the person or the people or the group or whatever it is that is going to pay for your product at the end? Now, you need to know that because otherwise you don't know who your audience is. Um, and this is what separates a, uh, you know, a commercial product from a short film. So short film is great because people can can make short film and they can explore their creativity. But short film isn't a commercial product because generally there isn't a person, a, 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 a paying, like there isn't a paying audience member at the end of the process, right? There, but there is in um, feature film and in many other, you know, um, 
uh, streaming and uh, you could be you could be developing a pilot and then the the paying audience at the end will be a um, you know a, a buyer for a TV channel so it's not necessarily what I mean your target audience it's not necessarily the audience member that's going to kind of consume it on you know some streaming channel although it might be you definitely need to think about that as well but you also need to think about your target audience in terms of who is the person in the industry that's going to buy it who are the um you know who are the buyers of your particular product in the industry that have got a pipeline to an audience and the audiences that you're trying to connect with uh, so can you see how beginning to think about these things kind of reframes, might reframe some things in your mind? And unless you're able to, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> unless you're able to um, quickly explain what it is, how much it's going to cost in a detailed way, what it's going to make, and, you know, who who you're position, posi positioning it towards, both um, audience members and both industry kind of partnerships, then... Uh, unless you can answer those things, then you don't you don't know what you're making, or you don't know you know you're still you're still in the in the amateur sphere of the industry. You're not mo you're not a professional yet. So I just wanted to kind of linger on this target audience point. Where's my mouse gone? There it is. Um, because what makes a project valuable in the eyes of the industry is a really big talking point, and it's 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 worth um you know spending some time so spending some time on it but how to frame how to how to frame this so the most important thing the most valuable thing to your production and your project is and th to the industry in general is this point here is where's my mouse gone is the potential audience attention Excuse me. Audience attention means value. Means it's the same thing. That value is ultimately attention from an audience, and ultimately, you know, a purchase a purchase, whether it's a purchase through a streaming platform or a cinema ticket, or whether it's you know a, a, just a click to watch. But then there's advertising on it, and then so the that's that's where the value is generated. That's where the money's generated. But the money isn't generated without the audience's attention, all right? It's pretty obvious. I just, I just wanted to make that point really clear. Um, so what brings... What's this? Three audience... Why have I put three there? I'll get to that in a second. I don't know why I've put three there. But anyway, um, what brings audience attention, right? Now, um, so therefore, what is uh, valuable to... I hope I'm being clear... What is valuable to the industry? What potential industry players, so sales agents and distributors, what do they find valuable? Now, <coughs> I've got a list of things here. I'm going to go through them. So obviously stars. If you if you have a star in your project, it's going to be much easier to open doors. And um, if you get a star, if you're lucky enough to get a star, then... Um, if you're if you're in development, get them on a pay or play contract or at least a kind of a signed note of intent. Because if you just get a verbal a verbal agreement, like somebody saying, "Yeah, I'd love to," I mean, I, I might be interested, and then you use that to kind of market the project. That's not okay. The industry frowns on that. You need to get um, a signed contract. Pay or play contract means whether or not you know they're contractually obliged to do the project if the funding comes in place. So look into that. Um, obviously, named directors. If if you if you're a director that has already done something, um, you're gonna you carry weight in the industry. You carry potential audience attention, so you carry value. Um, what else is valuable? Famous a famous story, like for example, book rights. If you're a producer and you've got the rights to Harry Potter, you've uh, optioned it, so you have the rights to you know make it into a feature film in the next five years then um, that's incredibly valuable because it's a famous book. It carries audience attention. Um, perhaps there is something that you're, exp uh, you're expanding in a new genre, um, something that's never been seen before. Uh, something that just came to my mind was is, is Saw. Remember Saw, that horror movie? Um, it was marketed in a way that made it kind of like seem like a, ground, a, a new thing in the horror genre. Um, but... And then it doesn't have to be the horror genre. That's just a really clear example. But if there is something in the uh, there's something new that you're exploring in a genre that's never been seen before, um, that's valuable because it 
um, genres carry fans and if there's something new then that's attractive to, to fans of horror for example um, uh, obviously stunts and explosions they exist in the industry for a reason right you know it, 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 we, um, you probably wouldn't shouldn't be focusing on stunts and explosions unless you've got you know millions in the budget but um, it's potential you know it's, it's, um, it's a potential for you to, to explore uh, riding a new trend is val is valuable as well. For example, um, I've got an example written down here of Blumhouse and Megan. If you remember that movie, uh, just as AI was coming into the news, it was coming, um, I think, just before, just after ChatGPT had been released. So suddenly there was an explosion again of people's um, talking about AI. Then Megan was released not long after that. So what Blumhouse probably have is a whole library of content, of, of scripts that they've optioned and potential projects that they that they can make and then when something hits the, the zeitgeist then they have a script ready to go they can move into production very quickly and they can ride that wave so they they released megan and it was distributed around the world in cinemas um and anything that has a potential that has already has a built-in audience for example you know a regional story about a local an event or a local hero or a person or something you know something historical has a potent, has a built-in audience um sequel to something that's already existed has an audience because people have already watched it you know fans of things and um stories about groups of people in general you know if somebody i don't know why this popped into my head but if somebody made a movie about uh, mormons perhaps this isn't the best example but you know um if somebody made a, a movie about indie filmmakers let's say then that's got a potential uh, audience uh, base straight away. So I'm going to hammer this point in again because it's really important. Potential audience attention is value. So you need to be able to identify beyond my film's really good and people are just going to want to watch it because it's for everybody. You need to identify why your film, your your the film that you've already made or the film that you're making, why it has uh audience potential audience baked in i hope i you know i i'm hammering that point home but i hope i have it's not i hope it's clear <coughs> excuse me so um three pillars of value so this is moving on from value it's still we're still in the in the realms of value obviously what are the three pillars of value the three things that you can focus on to to improve to and and, and look at your project and see how you can make it better. So the first is the product, and that's obviously the story. And I want you, I'm gonna go through these, and I want you to think about a score that you'd give yourself out of 10. And uh, if you have a really good, uh, you know, give yourself a score from one to 10, just keep it simple. So products, your story, out of 10, what could, would you give it? Obviously that's the most important thing. It has to be a really good thing, as I said, but it has to go beyond beyond that. Number two, the team. Out of 10, the team that you have, including yourself, um, it could just be you, but at this stage, you should be kind of partnering with some, you know, more people to to uh, to support your application and to also, you know, potentially you've already made something, so that's different. But um, even, well, no, actually, when you have made something, you're, the team that you've made it with, what, what would you, what would you give them out of 10? And your market plan. So who are the sales agents? Who are the distributors? What area of the industry are you um, focusing on? What score would you give yourself out of 10? Now, if you can't give yourself 10 out of 10, and most you, sh you shouldn't be able to, because if you if you could give yourself 10 out of 10, then you probably, you know, you would, wouldn't be need to watch this video. Um, then you know if you can't give yourself 10 out of 10 then you know which areas you need to work on you can identify how to improve the, your next one right so let's go on to <coughs> excuse me let's go on to some examples now as i said at the beginning of the workshop these are examples from the liftoff global network they've come through the festivals or they've come through market representation um they're from all throughout the years, but I want to spend some time, uh, I'm gonna spend some time going through each one. I'm gonna tell you, uh, and we're gonna um, see what we can learn, right? So let's just get into it. So first of all is Ken Foster. Can I do this? There we go, yeah, perfect. Ken Foster. Now Ken Foster, 
What is Ken Foster? Ken Foster is a bio biographical documentary about a Vancouver street artist, Ken Foster, an enigmatic figure, a prolific street artist. Now, that's a terrible logline. Um, it's a documentary about a crack-addicted homeless artist who paints art furiously for his... Um, for, to, to fund his crack addiction. So, now... What's the genre? It's a bio documentary. It's a it's a biographical documentary. It's a feature. It's a feature documentary. And um, so, what happened with this project? So, the, we took this project to, uh, with Liftoff Markets representation. We um, partnered um, uh, Josh, the the, the 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 director. We partnered Josh. He met with Devil Works, which at the time they were a new new sales agency. They're now a um, bespoke boutique horror. Um, sales agency but at the time they were doing other things as well so um, they they had a meeting they decided to to sign a deal now De um, Devil Works a sales agent uh, signed the rights then they um, found distribution deals in Canada it had a small release and it was also on VOD for a while there and what can you learn so this is a, just a really simple example basic rights deal the owner of the um, the owner of the the rights which was Josh met with a with a sales partner uh, part the, who a, a sales agent is somebody that looks for um dis, uh, deals with distributors in many parts of the world and will partner your project with them they take a fee generally 20 percent of any monies that come from the distributor obviously the distributors take their fee and then the, and then the remainder goes to the producers which is uh, you know the, or the rights holders which in this case is, is josh and uh, so this, I just use this example because it's a really basic rights deal. Um, you take your project, it's completed, you sign the rights to a sales agent and say, you can control the rights for a certain amount of time to find dis distribution deals. Any distribution deals you find, you take 20%. So it um, incentivizes the sales agent to you know, find as many deals as they can because they get 20%. 20% of zero is zero, so they need to try and you know, make some money. Um, and then you're giving them 20% because you think or you believe or you trust that their partners, ships or their, their knowledge of the industry, they have, you know, wider spread than you'll be able to do or you and your, your team will be able to do. Um, there is something else to mention about the Ken Foster, actually. Ken Foster, so Josh had a real problem with E&O insurance, which is errors and emissions insurance. And what that is, is um, an insurance that distributors will need because... If they if they put their if they put the project in wherever it is in cinemas let's just say and um, in this case uh, <coughs> what's his name Ken Foster if Ken Foster came back and said hey I was I was exploited I didn't agree to this I'm going to sue you um, that's a problem so that there, there has to be uh, chains of titles so everybody has to sign contracts saying that their creative work that they've that they you know that they um, that they agree to their uh, creative work being used in this project. So there has to be like rigorous, if you don't know, know these things, look it up. I'm just gonna really briefly touch on them. Like, there has to be rigorous paperwork um, showing that you own the intellectual property for everything in the film. And you have to have all this, art, everybody that's involved in the film has to have signed contracts. And then you also have to be able to go with all of those contracts to an insurance provider, which is for errors and emissions, because there's so many different things that maybe something is missed. And just to cover the distributors back or whoever is responsible for the, you know, the, 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 the distribution of the thing, um, just to cover their back, you get errors and emissions insurance so that if somebody sues you, then you uh, are covered with insurance, right? You don't go out of business. So to get all of that, you have to have all your paperwork in place. Now, uh, Josh, this was a really indie, this was a really like run and gun indie film. He had everybody's permission. He had all the right things in place, but he didn't get contracts. So he had to go back retrospectively and get everybody to sign stuff, which is a nightmare as you can, as you can imagine. So if you're beginning to think about creating work on a professional level, make sure that you know what these things are. Cool. So the next um, <coughs> example was the trade from 2017. Now the trade, uh, what is it? What is the trade? The trade, um, let's read the synopsis. Ten years after his retirement, deathmatch wrestler Nick Monzo, Mon Mondo excuse me, is distressed to find a new generation mimicking his former self-destructive antics based on a true story. Now it's an action, a bio biography, drama. So what happened with the trade? 
Um, we took the trade and we, um, oh, actually, sorry. I forgot, I wanted, to, I wanted to go through what the value of the project was. So I wanted to go through what it is, what's so, you know, the, the, the log line and the genre, and I wanted to go what the value to the industry was. So Ken Foster, what's the value? What do you think the value is? It's a local hero story. So um, Ken Foster is a, is a kind of semi-famous person in and around Vancouver. Uh, many people know who he is. Um, so it's got a potential built-in audience, right? That's the value. It's a local filmmaker story. Now, the trade. What is it? Oh, that's Matt Burns there. Um, uh, I've I already read the, the the synopsis. It's an action. It's a drama. What's the value? The value is well, Matt Burns was a again. It's a this is a, a this is a built-in audience because it's he's a semi he was semi famous. He was a star in his kind of like um, in, in his um, what's the deathmatch wrestling kind of arena of things. Um, Nick Mondo, Mick, Nick Mondo was his kind of character that he played, <coughs> that Matt Burns played, excuse me, and um, he was well known, so that carried a, a you know potential audience. So that was the value. So what happened? So he signed with Indie Rights. Um, Indie Rights distributed worldwide by a streaming platform. So Indie Rights are a um, are a digital a, a digital specialist in distribution. They have and close relationships with many of the streaming platforms and they'll help you get onto many of the streaming platforms. Um, so what can you learn from this? So again, basic rights deal, trade signed with uh, Indie Rights. Indie Rights takes 20% of any of the deals that they find. In this case, they um, partner, the partner the trade with streaming platforms. Um, revenue comes from streaming platforms, goes to Indie Rights. Indie Rights takes 20%, gives it to Nick. And... Um, uh, what else can you learn from this? So when, when, uh, not, not Nick, Matt, when Matt was, oh, excuse me, my phone's ringing. When Matt was um, distributing this project, he had his heart set on a cinema release. He really, really wanted to get it into cinemas. And the problem was that it wasn't really a cinema project. So Indie Rights um, uh, convinced him that streaming was the better way to go. Now, I wanted to highlight this because uh, it is a common thing that I've seen that people have their heart set on a cinema release. Perhaps a small cinema release is fine, but just ask yourself, is is a cinema release for the trade? Would, the, would a cinema release really be um, suitable? I don't know, but they, they, ended, they ended up going um, online. So Where the Windmills Are, this was originally called Where the, Wind, Wind, Where the Windmills Are. There's an interesting story here because it was rebranded and renamed to Teenage Love Bomb. So what is it? The seventh grader Thomas lives in a small city in Denmark. He is in love with the school's tough girl, Vicky, and gets close to her. He has to help her get uh, help her and a gang of older boys um, blow up their teacher's bike. The head of the gang is Vicky's boyfriend. Again, that's a terrible, terribly written um, uh, synopsis. Perhaps it's because it, I think it's Danish. Uh, where is it? It doesn't matter. Um, it's 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 not it's not a, it's not an English speaking project, so perhaps it's a translation. But anyway, um, what's the genre? It's a drama thriller, feature drama thriller. What's the value? Well, the value of it was that it is it's a regional film. Um, yeah, it's a Danish it's a Danish film. It's fr it's a very um, indie art house project, which is danger. I'm going to come on to that in a second. It's a it's a dangerous. It's a dangerous thing, but it's a. It was a. It was a. Um, uh, so why am I showing you this one? Because, let, okay, let's go into what happened. What hap What happened with this project? So, where the windmills are, they signed with California Pictures. Um, California Pictures are a sales agent and distributor. So sometimes this is an important point. Actually, sales agents and distributors can sometimes be one and the same. They sometimes they handle sales and distribute. They will handle distribution in local territories. They'll you know sell the rights in in other territories. Don't worry about the details there. But this is why there's confusion between the two. So California Pictures are a sales agent and a distributor. Um, but the project really struggled and it really struggled because of something I was hinting at earlier. It's kind of a coming of age drama by an unknown filmmaker, even though it's a very good project. And it was originally called Where the Windmills Are. 
so they didn't find any traction in the industry. Nobody was kind of nobody's kind of interested in this project, rightly or wrongly. It could be a really good project, and it is a really good project, but they struggled. So what California Pictures did, and this is instructive and it's interesting, California Pictures rebranded it to Teenage Love Bomb, and they focused more on the on the thriller aspect of the of of the project. Um, so what can you learn about this? So you can learn that sales and distribution can sometimes be the same company, like sales agent might do distribution and a distributor might also like handle sales in, in certain territories and certain media. Um, and also that they are going, distrib distributors are gonna shape the marketing or they should shape at least the marketing of your project because they know the key messages that are going to um, attract their audiences, right? So next one is Boiling Points. Now, Boiling Points is a super story. It's um, a, huge, a huge success. So what is it? It is, um, so the synopsis, enter the relentless pressure of a restaurant kitchen as head of chef wrangles his team on the busiest day of the year. And it's a drama and it's a thriller. So it's a one shot, one kind of continual shot, um, thriller drama about a chef that's kind of at boiling point um so um what's the value the value is or was and still is <laughs> the value is that um as well as it being a really good project it's star uh, it, it has a star in it so so um oh what's his name now <coughs> stephen graham excuse me stephen graham Stephen Graham is a an English actor who carries weights in the industry. He's a he's been in many many things. He's a known name, um, and the story behind this is that Philip Barantini made a short film called Boiling Point with with um, with with Stephen Graham. Uh, they won a Lift Off Season Award. They uh, took it. We took it to Cannes, and we introduced it to some people, and they had some conversations. And but guy, uh, sorry, Phillips Phillips. Philip's plan all along, and he'd already had the feature scripts for the for, for for Boiling Point, was to make the short, then then piggyback, make the feature film, and so he'd already had momentum. Right, doors were open to him because Philip Barantini starred in the short film. They could see a proof of concept. Philip Barantini carries weight and audience attention and value in the industry, so doors were open to him, and he could get a deal done and then get Spoiling Point produced and funded into a, into a, into a feature film. So it's a really fantastic st um, success, success story. It's, an, it's a great project. Um, I, you can still see it on Netflix, I believe, in certain territories, certain regions. Um, check it out. So uh, the value is it was, it was a star. Um, but what can you learn? You can learn that this was driven because of the package of the project. So... The package being Stephen Graham script and proof of concept short film, and you, how can you bring this into your own career? So if you can start working with names, start start trying to find people like Stephen Graham that can be in your project, and if you start thinking about that, then you're going to have to be thinking about why, you know, how to make it attractive to them to work with you, and um, why are they going to want to work with you. So this is a really great, great success story. Um, and then we're going to end on a couple of, of, of harder stories in terms of the route that the filmmakers had into the industry. They, they kind of struggled and there is some success. There's lots of success in these next two stories, but um, let's just get into it. I'll go into it. So... First one is As I Am, directed by Guy Davies. So what is it? It is a, a comedy, comedy drama romance. And the synopsis is set in the English countryside. Oh, excuse me. As I Am depicts small town adolescence. One week of school remains for Kai, an aspiring writer and his friends. How they spend this time will cost one of them their life and leave them changed forever. Now, it's coming of age drama. And it really struggled because it is a good project. But it's, again, indie, art house, kind of, um, they they say it's comedy here, but it's not like, it's not a comedy genre film. Um, it's indie, art house, really. And it um, kind of gets lost in the noise because of that, because of its no, no names and uh, 
uh, coming of age drama which is kind of saturated right it needs to be it needs to add something new to that genre to be to kind of break through and as i am is good but it doesn't quite excuse me for saying this guy you see this it doesn't quite like you know add something anything new to that it's a lovely film don't get me wrong and it's definitely worthy of 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 the success that it ended up having but it really struggled at the beginning because um because of the reasons i've just mentioned so what happened and this this is instructive because it's a different route guy decided to say you know fuck it and he decided to self-distribute it so he picked up the phone he rang cinema buyers he managed to kind of secure a couple of slots in um in cine worlds actually in the uk which is a huge cinema chain um at the time i don't know if they're still going around um and he uh so he self-distributed self-distributed because the cinema buyers uh at the time it was covid and there was not not many not much stuff coming through i believe so they um they just they decided to to to, to program it in a couple of cinemas guy self self promoted it he brought audience to the cinema and then um so he so he proved an audience demand so once an audience were consuming it at the cinemas then hbo took notice they saw that it was that it was uh, he had some press written up about this you know indie filmmaker just like making it happen for himself <coughs> and um wide management took him on and then and then he got a he got a worldwide distribution with hbo so it was a really fantastic story um and why do i bring this one up i bring this one up because you know audience attention is value so he proved there was an audience for his film because he got it into cinemas himself he brought audiences to the cinema then the industry took notice and the final one is uh my feral heart now my what is my feral heart first of all my feral heart is a drama um an indie drama and the synopsis is luke an independent young man with down syndrome stumbles upon a wild life and changing friendship now it's a really lovely touching fantastically made feature film by jane gull um in the in the drama genre but again it really struggled because it despite it actually you know it, it does have a built-in audience because the lead um is is a young man with down syndrome who is uh isn't defined by his down syndrome he you know he he works through his life despite it so it does have a built-in audience because of that and it and it did and it ended up getting becoming successful because of that um but it struggled initially because it's low, very it was it was low budget and it again no stars and in the drama art house kind of area genre um so what happened so so jane girl is an incredibly industrious filmmaker she managed to get it into um she had some connections to channel four so she managed to get it into she had a four-star review by mark mode in the guardian she had lots of press about it and then she did have a sales agent but it was still really struggling because the sales agent didn't quite know how to position it so um she managed to get a self-distribution she pushed a cinema release with our screen which is like a, um, a company that doesn't exist anymore, but there are similar companies out there. So look for them if this this interests you, but you can um, book cinema spaces around the country and you can get people to, uh, um, there's, it's like a social media aspect to it. And if they get sell enough tickets, then the street greening goes ahead. So because of the audience that she had, she managed to get this um, this distribution with our screen again she proved a demand audiences came to the cinema to watch it so then she changed sales agents she signed with signed with a different one and then she got a deal with sky and she sold and 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 got um for for for, for, for what's the word for the cable rights and she got dvds and they it was eventually it was a success story but she really struggled at the beginning so um why do i bring this story up what can you learn again you can learn that audience attention equals value once the audience attention was proved then the industry took notice and she managed to get a deal. So I hope those are kind of instructive. There's so many different stories there with some common themes. The main theme, obviously, audience attention equals value. Um, but another thing that I hope you take away from that is that there isn't kind of a linear path into the industry. There isn't like a set route. Um, and you kind of have to be industrious and uh, make things happen. 
So this is market representation. Now, market representation is an initiative that helps you build connections with key industry players, understand, helps you understand what makes your project valuable, teaches you how to better position your projects in the marketplace um, with the Liftoff team representing your projects at the major film markets. We're going to take your proposals, we'll take your screeners and your projects to uh, our, our partners, sales agents, distributors. Um, we'll try and build new new partners because it's going to be bespoke for you at the major film markets at CAN, at AFM, at EFM. Now, our entire focus is securing meetings for you so that you can make connections with the key industry players. And our entire focus is to secure deals, to help you secure deals with potential parties. Now, that might be rights deals, that might be you know production deals, other things like that. Um, but our entire, our only interest, our only goal is to build, to get you to build connections to help you take your project to the next level. Now that, as I've said, and is said in the workshop, that means meetings, right? Um, and we want the whole process to feel like hanging out with friends, um, but with real business results. Now, who's it for? It's for uh, professional network members. You will need to be a professional network member. Um, uh, you need to have a market-focused project or a product. Um, that means, you know, it's not a short film. It, need, it needs to be a project with a potential paying audience at the end. You could have a, a feature in development with a short film as a proof of concept. That's a different thing. But if you're just trying to focus on on, on selling a short film, that's we, you know, we can't we can't really help you with that because not there aren't many routes to uh, to market for for that. So ideally, so actually, let me linger on this bit a bit a bit more. So market focused project. Um, it could be a feature film. It could be like a, um, as I said, a, a, a project with a proof, short as a proof of concept. It could be a, uh, you know, a pilot for a TV series or something. But it needs to have a, um, a potential paying audience at the end. Now, ideally, you'll already be in production and principal photography will already be started or be, you know, be starting soon because um, that's a really good time for us to kind of get on board and shape how you think about and where you think about the project is going to be, um, you know, connecting with. Um, if it's completed, we'll need to have like screeners that are available for us to, to show. And uh, it could be a project in development. But if it's in development, it needs to be beyond the script stage. It can't just be, you know, a final draft of, of, a, of a feature script. It has to have something else supporting it. Ideally, you know, two or three people in a team. Um, and uh, some other thing, maybe like a proof of concept or something like that, as I covered before. Now, how to join. So the price is $197 a year. If you go to liftoff.network forward slash membership, I'll also put links under here, I'm sure. Um, pay the $197 membership fee and you need to go to the professional members group. Uh, you can see it on the side in the hub. And if you're already a, already a professional member, go there and um, find the market representation area. You will be able to send in your application. We're, we're currently leading up to Cannes, to the Cannes Film Festival. And the deadline, the current deadline is the beginning of May. Um, we may extend that deadline, but there is a, definitely a hard deadline by the middle of May because that's when the festival starts. Um, but I'll get to deadlines. I'm gonna. I'll probably send you emails um, to remind you anyway of the deadlines to get your application in. Um, earlier the better, obviously, because we need to do some like bespoke work for each project to to figure out positioning and 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 things like that. Um, so complete your market representation application as soon as you possibly can. Um, the deadline is currently the end of April. So as of as of recording this um, this this workshop, it's in in about ten days time. Um, and once you've got your application in, we will uh, go through the application, provide feedback, how you can make it better. And also we will then um, uh, start to think about how we can position you. Um, if you have any questions, obviously email me. My email is there. You probably already have it as well. Um, there was a couple of things that I wanted to mention at the end. So I just wanted to give um, some time for questions. Um, but let me just check I've covered everything that I need to. Da, 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 da. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to actually just talk about um, this. We get this question a couple of times. What you know, what is Liftoff's fee? Our only fee is the membership fee. And it should be I should mention that the membership fee is the fee for professional membership in general. It, um, um, market representation is is part of the membership. We keep the fee really low. 
um you know we don't you, and you don't even need to be part of market representation market representation to get value from professional membership there's also free submissions to everything there's also the production accelerator workshop which will teach you how to produce content that's you know ready for this there is the um uh, 30 day concept challenge uh, so there's a there's a whole host of other benefits of being a professional member so we and so we you know we hope that you get uh value from it regardless of the outcome of 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 market representation because the reality is that you know it's it's a long process it's exceptionally hard to get deals and to figure out um you know to to to, to go through these processes so that we often get the question of you know what's the guarantee uh, can you will my film uh, if i if i pay 197 dollars will i get a deal it's like no but there's nothing that it's not it's obviously it's not like that um we, you know we we can only guarantee that we'll help you uh better position your project and we'll give you some insights into how it might fit and uh we'll um do our best to get you as many uh, meetings as you can and it should be said that our efforts at the film markets, whilst we will be representing your project at the film market, it doesn't take, we're, we're acting as your, um, what's the best way, like producer's representative. We're not a sales agent. We're not trying to sell your project and get deals. So we're not taking any part of your, your rights. We're trying to build relationships for you. And it should be said that you should be doing that yourself as well. Um, and uh, I should, I'm just going to linger on rights a little bit as well, because we don't get involved in any deals. We don't get involved in negotiations. We'll give you advice on what we think, obviously, um, when it gets to that. But when it gets to that, you're going to need to have um, other partners, perhaps your agent or perhaps, you know, some kind of, uh, you know, entertainment lawyer or something to to get to 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 go through that we can't get involved in that and that's why we you know that's why we keep the fee so low we don't want to take any part of your rights we want you to be the sole sole owner of everything um and you know there's no exclusivity or anything like that um we are just trying to get you meetings and deals so um what else is there to say? I think that's kind of covering everything. If you have any questions, please write them um, in the comments below or send me an email, however, however you prefer. If you want to keep things, you know, um, uh, off, offline, we can have a discussion offline as well. And um, I just wanted to say best of luck with everything. And I really look forward to connecting with your project. And I really look, this is the part of the, the, uh, of, the of my job that I enjoy kind of the most, really. I, I enjoy... I, I love festivals and I love awards and I love screenings and all of that. But um, uh, the, you know, the next step of things is always kind of the most interesting area to me. So um, uh, thank you very much for watching this workshop. Let me know what you thought. And if, you know, you need clarification on anything, let me know. And um, for those of you that do wish to join, uh, I recommend that you get on board right now. Again, go to um, liftoff.network forward slash membership. Get your application in as soon as you possibly can because it's just better for us. It's better for you. And um, we can get to work straight away. And if you don't, you know, you don't, as again, as I said at the beginning of the video, you don't actually have, you don't have to be at this level yet. I hope that you learned something regardless. And uh, I hope that you are in, you know, inspired by something. So, Best of luck, everybody, and I'm sure I'll connect with you later. All right, much love. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.